good morning, everyone. My name is James, and I'm one of the pastors here, and it's so good to see you here this morning. We have been in a series called 40 over the past few weeks, and it's really just defining, um, looking back on life and then defining the, the future of what's to come and kind of what I want my life to look like going forward, and hopefully there's something in there that you can actually glean for your own life as well. And last week, we talked about leaving a legacy of faith. And if I want to do that, my life must be about discipleship. In my own life, I can look back uh, over the past 20 years or so and realize that um, just how much God has used relationships in my life and other people who are following Jesus to help me become a disciple of Jesus. And God's still working on me. He's still uh, making me into what he wants me to be. Um, So we're in an interesting time right now to talk about relationships, right? Because we've got quarantines going on, we've got social distancing going on, and so it's really kind of a rough subject right now. Um, And so you're probably thinking, well, good luck with that, because I don't want to talk about that. Um, But we're being encouraged, you know, to, to separate from one another. And, and that's a little bit difficult to, uh, to do discipleship in that context, right? But being with other people is important uh, uh, for what God's called us to be and for, um, for who God has called us to be. Um, and so, you know, we can't just talk about discipleship and read about discipleship. We actually need other people to make disciples, each of us has to form relationships with others in order to make disciples. And, you know, relationships are difficult. I don't have to tell you that. Um, I'm sure if you've lived on this planet, even just as a child, you know that that's um, a struggle. In my own household, I've got two sons, and they're very different in age. And it's interesting to watch them interact because, you know, someone's always taking someone else's toy, and the other one wants this back, and this guy got this, and so I want this, and if you're a parent, you know what that's like, and so relationships, you know, even within our own families can be difficult, but we know just in general that they are as well, Um, and I've noticed myself that any human um, model that I look at for relationships is inefficient. It's lacking in its ability to give me what I need to be able to form Jesus in my life. And so, number one this morning, I need a better model for relationships. Um, You know, I need one that will help instead of hurt, one that will be life-giving instead of life-taking, one that will produce growth instead of devolving into conflict. And, you know, we, we all long to be a part of something with authentic and meaningful relationships with other people that's devoted to something larger and greater than our own individual lives. I think we all have that within us. And thankfully, God has already provided this example. Um, You know, before any human relationship ever existed, God existed in three persons. God exists as God in three distinct persons. He's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Each one is equally God, um, and each person has distinct roles within the Trinity. Let's take a look at Genesis 1.26. We see this um, shown here. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God the Father is creator and ruler over the earth. God the Son is the Word made flesh who came to earth and lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and rose again. And then the Holy Spirit is the agent of change who helps us grow to understand and to obey God. And we see evidence of the Trinity all over the Bible, interacting with one another as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Every once in a while, we see them mentioned um, all together like this, let us make man in our image. But many times, we see them interact with each other. Um, And so the first thing I want you to notice about the Trinity this morning is the Trinity is loving. It's a loving relationship. Uh, In John 1, or 1 John 4, 8, it says this, God is love. So, you know, we always wonder, why would God love me so much? You know, I I don't understand it. I can't grasp it. I, I can't really get my head around it. Well, the reason that he does is because that's just who he is. God is love. He existed in love. Um, uh, as himself before we even uh, came on the scene. 
And so here's some examples uh, that we see throughout the scriptures. I'm not going to give you the specific reference, but just here's some things that we see. The father loves the son and has given him all things into his hand. The father loves the son and shows him all, all that he himself is doing. And then Jesus says, I do as the father has commanded me so that the world may know that I love the father. In uh, Matthew 3, 16 through 17, we see a beautiful picture of the Trinity interacting here and, um, and just, you know, showing the love that they have. And, and it says this, when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. So, you know, Jesus is being baptized, the Holy Spirit descends on him, and the Father says that he is pleased with the Son. And we just see right away that this is a loving relationship that's already been going on um, ahead of time. And it's, it's a relationship that shows cooperation and unity with one another. The Father gives the Son. The Son fulfills the plan of the Father, and the Spirit causes the growth. Um, there's no conflict there's no animosity. There's no one's fighting to be better than the other. They're working in perfect harmony together. Um, and Jesus is deferring to the Father's plan willingly. So the second thing I want you to notice about the Trinity this morning is uh, the Trinity works together. They're, they're united, right? They're cooperating with one another. In John 5, 19, Jesus says this. So, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of His own accord, but only what He sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And I think that's just amazing that, you know, here you see Jesus deferring to the plan of the Father. Later in His ministry, Jesus is in Gethsemane, and He's um, about to be delivered over to be crucified, and He's praying and, um, and sweating blood, right? And what does He say in that moment? In his prayer, he says, if there's any other way that this can be done, then let this cup pass. But then he follows it by saying, not my will, but yours be done. So even Jesus admits that, you know, what's going on and what's happening to him is hard, right? He was, he was a man as well. And so he was dealing with pain and hardship during that time. But at the end of the day, he was committed to the plan of the Father. And so he deferred to that plan and said, not my will, yours be done. And then in John 14, 26, Jesus describes the role of the Spirit. He says, um, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So Jesus is just expressing, look, there's going to come a time where I'm going to go away from you. I'm not going to be here physically with you anymore, but we've got a plan for that. You know, once I go away, the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's going to empower you and he's going to teach you and remind you of everything that I've said and everything that you're supposed to do. So I think that's just incredible to see the Trinity collaborating and coming together. No confusion at all. Um, each one knows their role. They come together for a purpose. A third thing this morning that I want you to notice um, about the Trinity is that they, they have a purpose. Um, they're united behind that purpose. Uh, Charles Spurgeon, who was uh, the great English preacher, he had this to say about the Trinity. He said, Learn then, O believer, to love all the persons of the divine Trinity alike. Remember that salvation is no more the work of one than of the other. They all agree in one. And as in the creation, they all said, Let us make man. So in salvation, they all say, let us save man. And each of them does so much of it that it is truly the work of each and undividedly the work of all. I really love that quote because it just sometimes we don't really see the full picture of those because we're focused on, you know, we kind of naturally categorize things, right? We like them in their place. And so we focus on the work of the Father and then we focus on the work of the Son. Then we, but we, we rarely kind of bring them all together and see just the beautiful picture of how they uh, work together and, um, and they have a purpose. And so the Trinity is loving, the Trinity is um, working together, and the Trinity has a purpose. And let's talk about this purpose. Jesus explains it in John six thirty eight. He says, and once again, we see him deferring to the Father's will. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So God's in this relationship, right? We're not on the scene yet at all. And God decides, you know what? I want to share the love that I have with the creation. I want something that is made in the image of God, someone that I can share this love with. And so um, God the Father created the plan of salvation, predestined our salvation. Um, God the Son comes down to die, take on flesh, and, and go on the cross in the place of our sins. And God the Holy Spirit takes up residence in Christians to regenerate them and ensure that their final salvation. I just think that's such uh, an amazing picture when you look at them together, this, you know, this loving, collaborative, working together community that has a purpose uh, and a goal in life, and they just defer to one another. They, you know, they, there's no arguing, there's no one-upping each other, they're just working together. And, um, you know, I realized point number two this morning that my relationships must build the church. When I think about what's missing in my own life and, and in the lives of others, I realize that um, it's really that sin has gotten in the way, right? That's really what's keeping us from having meaningful, loving relationships where we're united for one purpose. Sin is the problem. Um, but I think a lot of times we forget that. We, we get caught up and we just say, you know, people, I'm just done with people, right? I'm just, I've given up on them. They're just, they're mean. They don't listen. They hurt me. They'll never change. And the only one who loves me is my dog. I'm just going to go snuggle my dog and take my ball and go home. Right? I think we've all been in that place before where we've, where we've thought, if I could just get away from people, my life would be better. Right? But that's not true. Because God has built us for one another, and there's certain things that he has in mind about our relationships that he's going to grow us and build us. So right now in our culture, we have this thing called cancel culture. Have you heard of that? And it's mostly you know, online and through social media and things like that, but basically the idea is that if somebody says something that isn't in line with whatever the spirit of the age at that moment is, then they deserve to be canceled and made to look like a fool and basically cast away forever, right? And to me, it's just, it's incredibly sad to see that. Um, it's incredibly um, hurtful, and I think there's just no redemption in it. So I can't, you know, when I look at that, I can't see that in anything that God's called us to be um, as people. And, you know, it's just basic mob rule, and it's, it's, sad, it's sad to see that. But I think we need to remember that the problem isn't people, right? The problem is sin. And so we've got to acknowledge that reality. Um, you know, we don't have to hate people. We don't have to cancel people. Um, ultimately, sin is the problem, not the people. And before I ask the question, you know, what's wrong with other people? Don't you ask that? Don't you, don't you see somebody do something, whether it's somebody you know or just something that you see online or on the news or whatever, and you're like, what is wrong with people? What's wrong with these people? I don't get it. Well, you know what's wrong with them. It's sin. You know, it's the fall. It's been like this for a long time. Um, it just works itself out in different ways. But I think a lot of times when I ask that question, and I look at those situations and people treating each other poorly and acting poorly, I really need to look at my own heart and ask, what is wrong with me? You know, where am I missing the mark? Where... Where do I need to do better, right? Isn't, isn't that like, that's like the new thing people are saying too. It's like be better, do better. That's, I don't know, anybody else hear that? It's, it's like, a th I don't know what they mean because there's just better is a very subjective term for whatever you want it to mean. But um, of course we know what it, what it could mean. But, <laughs> but when I look at my own heart, I realize that I'm in need of saving that I need a right relationship with God before I can even have a right relationship with people. And the good news is there is hope. There is redemption. We don't have to be canceled. Um, Jesus has provided a better way, and, and there's hope in that. So 
Let's take a look at Ephesians 2, 14 through 22. There's a lot in this text that we can take away um, about our relationships in the church and about what God's called us to build. Ephesians 2, 14 through 22. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two. So making peace and might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God. By the Spirit. And look, in this verse, we see once again the Trinity, right? We see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all mentioned within here and all having a role in building us up as a body. So Jesus came and he dealt with the hostility. Now I can have access to the Father. If I trust in Jesus to save me, I'm part of the household of God. Um, and this is an amazing thing that he would offer to me, but it's not just for me, right? We're being built up together. So he offers it to anyone who will believe in him. And peace with God means that um, I can have peace with others now. I've reconciled to God. I can see God for who he really is. And I can see people for who they really are and what they need. Um, we don't have to be against each other anymore. Jesus has now given us something that we can be for. Uh, and, and that is the body of Christ, the gospel. So the Bible says that we're members one of another. And what matters most now is that we come together to become the people that God wants us to be so the Spirit of God can live in us. So I think the concept of that we can kind of understand, right, and get and kind of see in our head. Okay, that makes sense. You know, I, I understand with the church, you know, that, that we're a people and that we're here, right, and, and we're gathered. But the question becomes, Jesus has reconciled us to himself, and he's created his body, but now how are we going to live that out? How do we practically become reconciled to one another as we go on in our life? How are we going to do this? Well, I think the first thing that we need to do is recognize that it's not about me anymore. You know, we said that earlier, but it's, it's really about building the body. Jesus died to make us one, um, and God wants to build a church. I think sometimes I get caught up in just focusing on building myself, right? I'm like, well, these people, they're so complicated, and, and I can't get along with them. I'm just tired of them. So you know what? I'm just going to do me. I'm going to focus on building me. And at the end of the day, that's going to work out great, and, um, and I'll be better than everyone else, and I'll show them. That's not the vision, right? <laughs> Clearly, that's not the vision. Um, God wants to bring us together as one as his body. And um, in Ephesians 5, Paul spends most of the chapter describing what it looks like for the church to walk in love. And then he ends, at the end of Ephesians 5, he says this, Ephesians 5, 19 through 21. He says, here's some of the things that the church does together. Uh, they're addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all your heart, uh, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, submitting to one another out of reverence to Christ. And you're like, what? Hold on. All those other things, we're fine. You know, I'm, I like singing songs. That's cool. I can pray and give thanks to God. That's great. What is, the, what is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ? I don't like that. That doesn't sound good. It's not something I want to do. Um, and, and why is that? Because we see each other in the flesh sometimes. We see each other as competition, right? We're, we're unable to get over those, those barriers sometimes. And, um, and so we read something like that, and we're just like, well, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't like that guy. Um, I don't like the way that person smells. They, they, you know, <laughs> they wear weird clothes. Uh, they like this kind of music that I don't like. Um, they support that football team. I could never 
you know, be friends with somebody who's into that team. Um, you know, you name it, right? And, and I think one thing that's social media has made this even harder because now everybody can put that out online 24-7, right? And just represent whatever it is their, their personal preference is. And so now we have even more reasons we look at to divide one another and, and look at each other uh, in a different way. But, you know, when you read this verse, you got to focus on the second part. I think that's the part that really helps you understand why submitting to one another is, is so important. You're not submitting to one another because you think that person's better than you or because you think that um, they have something different uh, going on in their life. You're submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Okay? So it, it's the fact that you love Jesus so much and what he's done for you and what he wants to do through you in his church that you're going to submit to another person and work together with them so that the body can be built. And, and you know, I think this is such a, a difficult thing. It's not an easy thing to do. But I think when we realize that Jesus shed his blood for other people, um, it, it helps us because we, we look at people differently now. So I think a really important thing is that we stop looking at people um, the way we naturally want to look at them and look at the way that God calls us to look at them. Uh, and that's hard. You know, what, what do we do with our relationships? We look for people who are easy to get along with, right? We look for people that have things in common with us. Um, you know, we, we look for similarities. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think God can work through that, and that's okay. But when that's all you have, how is that any different than what the rest of the world is doing? Who's at the center of that decision when you choose to only um, gravitate towards people who are similar to you? Well, me. I'm the one at the center of that, right? But who needs to be at the center? Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone, right? He's, the church is being built up with Jesus as the cornerstone for him and by him. So I have to try and see people as God sees them. You know, God is going to use uh, people who are different than you to build his church. We can only get along if we change the way that we view people. Um, look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 15 through 16. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore... We regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So if I'm going to not live for myself anymore, um, you know, I've got to look at people differently. I've got to see them as Jesus sees them. I've got to see them as souls that Jesus came to save. I've got to see them as people who Jesus thought that it was so worthwhile to shed his blood and die on the cross for them to come to know him. That's how God's going to use us in each other's life. And you know, that's not easy. It's not natural, right? The natural thing is to notice everything that's different and everything that we can to divide ourselves from one another. And so if I'm going to do that, I need to look um, at people in a, in a different way, in a spiritual way. And so uh, this morning, point number three my relationships need more Holy Spirit. And let me just recap and, and catch us up so that we can kind of have a context for this. So we started out this morning talking about how God is a relational God, right? He's loving. He works together. Uh, he has a purpose. And he's reconciled me to himself through Jesus and made me a part of his body. And now this changes how I see people. So I need to see people as more than just flesh. I need to see them as souls. Um, and this is, this is hard. We're going to need God's help for this. We cannot do this on our own, in our own flesh. And I think, you know, one reason why discipleship backfires is that we, we have these expectations on one another that are unrealistic and that aren't God's expectations. We, we have no grace for people. We have no patience for people. And, you know, we, we struggle to see when someone sins differently than us. It's hard for us to accept that and to see that. Um, but I know for me, the relationships that have endured, that have meant the most to me, and that have helped me grow throughout my life's, 
my life has, have been relational, or I'm sorry, have been spiritual ones, have been ones where um, the Holy Spirit is working uh, through us uh, to grow us. So take a look at what um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13, about the role of the Spirit. And I got to say, like, as I was reading, I'm going to pause really quick here. As I was reading through these different verses and trying to decide which verse I wanted to use here, it, it blew my mind just how many times the Spirit pops up in, uh, in the New Testament especially, but in, in the church age, and just how much God has um, prioritized the Spirit to work in the church. And I think sometimes, for me, I grew up in the church, and so the Spirit can sometimes be neglected because we think of it as some kind of weird you know, you know, like Star Wars force or something like that, that we're just going to project onto someone. But, and there is some mystery to the spirit, right? It's, it's God. So th- there are some things we can't understand. But I think there are many things we can understand and we should try to understand and recognize that the spirit is a person. The spirit is God. All right, so 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. These things God has revealed to us through the spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit of that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So as I build these relationships, as I, as I build these discipleship relationships, I've got to recognize that this isn't just a, um, an intellectual exchange of information, right? It's not just making sure that we've got all our points and our theology accurate. We should. It's important that we characterize God the way he wants to be characterized in the Bible. But it's not just that. There's something bigger going on, and the Holy Spirit is working between uh, people as as they're growing in discipleship relationships uh, for growth, and I, I think this is important that we recognize this um, that we're growing in spiritual truth and we're bearing spiritual fruit. Something supernatural and amazing is happening between these two people, and um, you know it's because they have the same goal, right? To build up the church and to grow to become more like Jesus. Um, and God has in mind through discipleship relationships, that we should become transformed by the Holy Spirit. There should be change. And this change doesn't happen in our flesh. Naturally, it happens through a work of the Spirit. We've got to walk in the Spirit. So as a Christian now, I want to look for every opportunity that I have to get more of the Spirit in my life. I no longer want to feed the flesh. I want to uh, grow in embracing the Spirit of God. And God can use other people to help me do this. Um, In Romans 8, 8 through 10, Paul says this, Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So we know that we belong to God because we have the Spirit. The flesh and the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life and produces righteousness, produces spiritual growth in our lives if we trust the Spirit, if we trust in Jesus. So, um, you know, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will produce uh, trust in God, distaste for sin, love for the church body, uh, the ability to overcome temptation, and protection from Satan. And I need those things in my life, right? As we build these relationships and we let the Spirit work in our lives, what are some things that we should expect the Spirit to do in us? Well, listen to what Paul says in Galatians 5. He talks about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things... There is no law. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. You know, I don't know about you, but those are some things that I actually need in my life. Those are some things that 
will help me become the person God wants me to be. Those are some things that really will help me build relationships that last, right? If we have those things in our life, don't you think that we could do no wrong? That people would, we'd actually be able to work together with other people and be loving? That we'd be able to unite around something? So as I read those things, I want those in my life. I want the Spirit to work in my life, and I need to stay in step with the Spirit. Make sure that as I make disciples, that I recognize the Spirit's work in me and through me. Um, I think what's special about the relationships that we build within the church and within discipleship is that, you know, we, we tell each other, hey, I'm for you. I support you. I'm on your side. I'm pulling for you. I want good things for you. But even more than that, I want God in you. I'm pulling for God in you. I want to see the Spirit move in your life and produce good fruit for God that pleases Him, that helps us build the body. Um, and, you know, that to me is the deepest, most meaningful relationship that I can have with another person. I want the Spirit to work in my life. Um, and, you know, the people, as I build these relationships, I. I want people that will pray for me, that will encourage me, and build me up towards these things. So this morning, you know, just as we, as we close up with this verse in Hebrews, um, you know, you're building these relationships so that you can stay close to God, so you can be built up in His Spirit. And I just want to remind you, the church is essential. Discipleship is essential. So you have to decide, how am I going to pursue that? Um, in my life. In Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, it says this, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So there's coming a day when Jesus will return for his church and I'm looking forward to it. I want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. But until that day, I have work to do. You have work to do, and it involves other people. It involves relationships. The work is building up the church into a dwelling place for God, and we've got to continue to put ourselves in these environments and build these relationships for that to happen. Many of you in this room are different people because of the people that you have met in this church. You've grown to become something that you never thought you could be because God has worked through someone else's life to help produce fruit in your life. And there are many in here who still have yet to grow, and you will grow. And it's just incredible for me to think about how somebody who's totally different than you, who you never would have expected, God will use them in your life to help you grow to become more like Jesus. And that is a work of the Spirit. You can't explain that other than that. So three things this morning before I go. Three application points. Number one, you need to change the way that you view people. People don't exist for you, they exist for God. Once you realize that they are God's and that he has a purpose for them, you start to understand that purpose and work with God to help others become all that God wants them to be while you yourself are growing as well. When people struggle, we don't cancel them, we don't dismiss them, we bear with them in love and we look for ways that God wants to redeem them and we look for ways that God wants to use us in that relationship. And then the second application point this morning, we need to build relationships that matter. There's so many different things you can get caught up in and so many different people you could meet and pursue, but you need to build relationships with other Christians in order to make disciples and to be a disciple. At this church, there's a number of different ways you can do that. Uh, We have serve teams. We have community groups that you could be a part of. Um, The core classes are coming up this fall. Uh, We've got discipleship groups here. There's so many different environments that you you could become a part of those relationships. But you have to make that choice. I can't make that choice for you. Just show up. Show up to things. Um, And, and, you know, you will meet people that God is going to use in your life. And then the final um, application point this morning is just trust the Spirit to work in people's lives. Discipleship takes time and effort, and it doesn't always produce what we expect. Sometimes it can be disappointing. Um, But remember, it's the Spirit that's working and producing fruit. 
Make sure that that's true of your own life because if that's not true, who are you making a disciple of? Are you doing it in, in the flesh? Are you making them a disciple of just you and your own abilities? Or are you making disciples of Jesus? Is the Spirit actually working through you to build up other people? Every week we take communion here at Village and um, this is a meaningful time for us to reflect on the cross, reflect on all that God has done uh, for us. And so this morning as we... Um, take the cup and the bread. There's, those have been put on your seats already. They should be near you. Um, we just want to think about the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and really be thankful for that. Remember that. If you're a Christian, if you've trusted in Jesus, take the bread, take the cup, and, um, and just celebrate the work that Jesus has done and what he's continuing to do in your own life. Mm-hmm.